number four, the search itself is a miracle. We celebrate Hanukkah for eight days because of the miracle of the menorah. There was sufficient oil found to light the menorah in the temple for just one day. And the menorah continued to burn for seven more days. So why do we count the first day? We should just make it a seven day holiday. After all, the first day is natural. It wasn't miraculous. Because we want to say that even searching for the oil was itself a miracle. The Beis HaMikdash had been desecrated by the Greeks. The Jews could have given up and said, who cares? Why should we bother? They brought pigs into the Beis HaMikdash. They brought Abu Zarah. Why even try? The fact that they even tried was a miracle. That they didn't just give up and fall into despair. And that's the message here. Instead of giving to despair, the Hashemarim took action and refused to surrender to hopelessness. And that's our message. The message, we cannot refuse, we cannot fall to hopelessness. We have to push forward regardless of how circumstances look and how bleak it may seem. In life, we can easily raise our hands up and say, it's impossible. Why bother trying? The search for the oil was the triumph of their spirit. And that's the lesson we want to walk away with. That you have to get up there and make the effort, even if it seems like the odds are way stacked against you. Every search for light and your life force, despite that brings you down, is a miracle. Let me share two amazing stories with you about a woman who had not had kids for over five years. And there she was one day in Geula in Yerushalayim, and she spied a beautiful maternity dress in a window of a, shul, of, of a store that sold maternity dresses. And she walked in there, and the lady said to her, when are you expecting? She says, I'm not. No, not at all. So she says to her, you know what? How much is that dress? And she told her how much it was. And so she came back a few days later and she decided to buy the dress. And the sales lady gave her very, very heartfelt brachas. Before she left the store, she asked her to come back and let her know if there was good news. Esther left, that was the woman's name, the consumer, came home with the outfit, showed it to her husband, wrapped it in a heavy plastic bag, put it in a different room in the far corner of the closet, assuming it'll probably sit there for a long time. She kept the purchase a private matter between herself and her husband and didn't tell anyone, not her parents, her in-laws, or her friends. And Hashem has his ways of, of sending Yeshua's or salvations and miracles. And just a few months later, Esther was finally expecting. And soon she was able to put on the outfit and go back to the sales lady and let her know the good news. Boy, was that lady happy for her. She asked Esther to come back when the baby was born, and she did. And when her baby girl was a few months old, Esther made a special trip to see the sales lady. That's when the sales lady told us something amazing. When you bought that outfit and told me your story, and then you were expecting just a short while later, I told many of my friends how someone childless came into my store where I sell maternity dresses and bought a maternity outfit, and soon after she had a Yeshua. You should know that gave so many people chizik and inspiration. And many people followed your, your, your role and did the same thing. And that's important. The effort is critical, ladies and gentlemen. We can never stop and not make the effort because making the effort sometimes opens the door to the miracle. Let me share a story of an older single, a woman who had become Jose Bechuva, a woman who was, had gone to Neve Yishlaim for two years where they often host many Bali Chuva. And there she was, came back to her home city in, in Chicago and she took a job with a, uh, an organization that did Kiruv, outreach work. And she, was, she had a great job in which she was publishing many of the uh, printed matter for them. And uh, unfortunately, she had not gotten married. She was up there, getting older. And she was wondering, when is my time going to come? She says, I turned 27. It started catching up with me. Many of my friends were getting married and I was beginning to feel left behind. Soon, dating opportunities weren't coming up as frequently. And I began to question the decision to whether I should live in Chicago or maybe I should move to New York like everyone else. So I decided to consult my Rav. To my surprise, my Rav's response was, Hashem knows your zip code, Barbara. I understood that my Rav was trying to instill with me the idea that God is the ultimate matchmaker and I needed to learn and believe and it could happen in Chicago. I didn't necessarily have to move to another city. While well, I was a relief to hear that I didn't have to leave family, community, friends and work and especially my beloved Windy City, I had to admit that it was becoming more difficult to accept my situation as a lonely and single adult. And, and as a result, I just you know waited it out but I was getting very popular at my work and I decided they gave me a tremendous bonus. They were going to send me to the Far East to participate in a journalistic type of a, um, a, a you know, a, a, a meeting. And I, and I was going to, get, and I was upgraded, and I was given a, you know, a first class seat. And there I was sitting in the plane, and I was wondering, what's going to be with me? Am I going to make it in my life? Will I ever find my Beshert? So I called my rabbi, and I said, I need some chizik, and he gave me chizik, and I decided that I was going to do a stopover in Israel before I would get to the Far East, to Singapore, where they were going to have the meeting. It happened to be 
I said to myself in the plane as the tears came down my face, wait a minute, Hashem could send me on a trip around the world, but he can't manage to find me my shidduch? He can't find me my soulmate? I suddenly felt so ashamed for the way that I had spoken the other day in which I had poured out my heart to my friend that I felt that it was hopeless for me. And I realized that where was my amuna? Where was my faith in Hashem? I sat there in the dark of night on that memorable British Airways flight experiencing such an intense feeling of emotion and connection all the while repeating to myself the truth. Hashem runs the world and God knows my zip code and He can find me. Exactly three days later, I landed in Israel. My rabbi set me up on a date with a young man I actually knew from the community in Chicago. Yitzchak, who was his name, had come on the scene when I returned from Neve Yerushalayim, so I never thought of him as marriage material. However, after spending four lovely hours with him in the lobby of the David Citadel Hotel in Yerushalayim, I had to admit I was so pleasantly surprised by his demeanor, by his beautiful midos. Of course, I had been through this too many times before to get my hopes up. Little did I know that I would be spending a great deal of time with this inspired young man during my stay in Yerushalayim. We dined, we strolled, we laughed, and we shared. I just couldn't believe how open and deep and complimentary and interesting and witty and special Yitzchak was. And what's more, he really seemed to like me. The proof of the pudding came on our 10th date in a beautiful park on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. After a wonderful pickling lunch, we spotted a cute little lake with rowboats. We hopped aboard, we rode along and enjoying the breeze and beautiful scenery, just like the many other people there. After a while, Yitzchak pulled off to the side of the lake, parked us under a shady tree. He whipped out a little piece of paper from his pocket. I honestly couldn't imagine what's he up to, but I was certainly excited to find out. He asked me to close my eyes and then proceeded to sing a beautiful song that he had written, expressing how excited he, had, he was to have met me and how, how happy he was that I came come into his life. At the conclusion of his musical performance, I opened my eyes and asked him in disbelief, is this really happening? I can't believe it. Is this really true? Very soon after that memorable afternoon, it was time for me to return to Chicago. Yitzchak was right behind me, fortunately, following me back to the Windy City to finish the job. On an Arab Shabbos, the day after Tishbav, Yitzchak proposed on the balcony of a high-rise overlooking the Chicago skyline. It was at that moment that it dawned on me. Hashem did know my zip code. Yes, Hashem really knew my zip code. And not only that, but ironically, you won't believe it, Yitzhak's mother works for the United States Postal Service.